Welcome back to Metropole TV, the first 24-hour business news channel here in Kenya and East Africa. My name is Alikan Satya, I'm your host. This is The Smart Investor. And we've got a great guest in the studio today, Simon Wolf. Simon is the Managing Director of Marlow Strategy. Simon, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Simon, I came across you for the first time when you were doing some work on behalf of uh, Bobby Wine. Yes. Um, uh, not too long ago, he was he was uh, in detention, and then you were, I know you flew through, and you tell us a little bit about where you what space you're operating in. You are a lawyer, indeed. So m my practice is best described as fitting in that intersection of domestic, international law, and politics. Mm. So where you come across a legal issue that has some kind of political dimension whether that might be a breach of your human rights, whether your asset is being expropriated, whether or not there's some kind of governmental play against your business, and politics, of course, informs the value of your asset. Mm. That's where I yes. come in and help. Okay. So it's primarily a legal practice, but it's informed by the rest of the things which, of course, can affect one's investment. So give me a few examples uh, that you're able to speak about um, of, of work that you've done in that space. Bobby Wine is a, clear, is a good example. Bo I mean, Bobby, Bobby is a great example. I, yeah. mean, I mean, Bobby was and remains to be the most popular opposition figure in Uganda. Mm. Um, his human rights, of course, were deeply affected by the, being tortured by the government. Arrested and tortured, he's still continually harassed, subjected to different kinds of charges. So my role as a lawyer is to go in and, of course, help him with the international aspects of his legal protection. So taking it to the appropriate international bodies to ensure that uh, rule of law is, is, is guaranteed for him throughout his trial, such as it is, uh, to ensure that his personal safety and liberty are protected. But of course, what the Museveni government doing is deeply political. They're trying to A, discredit him, and B, intimidate him so that he doesn't bring a presidential campaign. So in order to combat that, you have to also deal in that same political realm mm. and identify exactly how he's under attack politically uh, and build a defence and a counter narrative or a description of the facts to sort of break through that, we call it all fake news now, right? Yes, yes. To sort of to cut through those mistruths. Wow. So now, so that's a, quite, that's a much bigger brief than what, a, what you'd imagine a lawyer was doing. It seems you're, you're also managing the message and the narrative. Well, and I, I think that's absolutely right. Mm. And I, sort of, I was sitting on a plane a couple of months ago starting mm. this new practice, and I thought, what is the clear why? Why are you mm. continuing this practice? Why are you starting this, this company? And it was obvious. I mean, clients come to you with problems. They don't come to you with a lawsuit mm. or, please, can you file this statement of claim in the London Court of International Arbitration? They say, someone is trying to steal my asset. Mm. Someone has put me in prison. Can you help me? And I think when you go to a traditional law firm, their first and obvious instinct, because they've done it for hundreds of years, mm. is to file a claim in a court. Mm. Well, of course, that's often appropriate, but, of course, the media relations is critical how you interface with the government who's attacking you, or other governments who might be able to place pressure on that government is critical. Um, so it's about working all of these different levers mm. in the resolution of that client's problem, because that has to be the focus. Mm. Let's, let's have a look at the world that we find it today. I mean, it's very fluid, fast moving. Um, let's touch on the US-China trade war. I mean, what's your perspective on what we're seeing there? I mean, just last night we've seen another escalation this is, this is the Google uh, Android story. Well, of course, there's, there's, mm. there's, that, there's that element. And that, that's a really interesting example because, because smartphones are so integral to how people I, I operate mean, their lives. I mean, I, I've put it over here and it's the farthest yeah. I've been away from it for weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so now what you're doing is you're saying to consumers, you can't have particular apps which mm. are integral to their lives. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to take on a different dimension, I think. Mm. And Huawei have really become a poster child for... They're huge the in Africa. Yeah. And, you know, their mobile phones and their, their devices are, are, yes. are, are of very, very high quality. Yes. Know? And then, of course, you would have seen yesterday um, a U.S. destroyer... Uh, but they've been doing that fairly regularly. What, you mean Mischief Reef or... Uh, it was Scarborough Shoal. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, I think that there is... I mean, they will say otherwise, but there mm. seems to be a deliberate cascading strategy where... All of these things happen at the same time. Yes. And I think also on that, I mean, we have to take a step back and look at the US 
operating as a whole. Mm. Because people assume that it's Trump directing an entire US military and, and economic not. complex. It's not. I mean, if you, even if you break it down and look at the US state by state, mm. you'll see how, how the tariffs will affect California differently from it will affect Texas, from you know, I, uh, mm. uh, Iowa. I mean, I think it, it'll have domestic implications for US companies in ways that perhaps weren't anticipated. Mm. And I mean, that sort of goes to the heart of exactly what we wanted to talk about today, which is volatility. I mean, yes. I mean, even on the, what were otherwise very you know, front and simple mm. geopolitical moves that you would make, I mean, increased tariffs yeah. usually would have some effect. And right now, we're seeing completely unexpected results. Such as? Well, I mean, that the way that it plays domestically in the US mm. is that you have some you know, state politicians as opposed yes. to federal politicians coming out in favour of China. Mm. I mean... <laughs> but what, particularly from the farm, farm belt, I imagine, right, right. Where, where, where they are really getting this, they are right. at the bleeding edge of it all. Absolutely. And mm. so the inconsistency on steel, I mean, mm. again, that's good for some states and terrible for other states. Um, I mean, it's at that point now where it's escalated so far, as, as you said in your intro, neither mm. Xi nor Trump can back down. Well, can they? I mean, I, don't, I can't. Xi has, has, his whole thing is posited on making China great again. I mean, and so is Trump. I don't see how they're going to back off this at all. There is, there is a sense, and I don't know if you mm. feel this in East Africa, of, of kind of waiting out Trump. Yes. Uh, is that this is a, you know a wonderful sideshow that's going to last four years or perhaps eight years? I think it's going to last eight. I, I think, think it's, it's probably going to last eight mm. years as well. Mm. Um, although <laughs> the, the precept of my argument is, who knows what's going to happen? Yes, but, no, that's right. But but there there is a sense of well, if we wait this out, mm. you know, things will return to to normal. But I think in the meantime, what we're seeing is a complete destruction of sort of the concept of multilateral institutions. Yes, and the and, and the sort of the rise of state based relations again, and I think that's going to have a, a longer lasting impact. Does that hit the legal world as well, doesn't it? Because if it's not no longer a rules-based order, multilateral rules-based order, where we've created these rules over like the last 60, 70 years, mm. and we're suddenly moving to this sort of very bilateral, um, out of the deal type approach, doesn't that upend a, a sort of legal system in many ways that has been there for the, all these years? I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you think about developments of legal systems, they mm. usually follow capital. Mm. And so if the dominant source and provider of capital is China, it stands to reason that the prevailing legal system, of course, will change. I mean, that's sort of on a macro level, mm. and you know, we'll, that will play out over decades mm. rather than the next couple of years. But what I sort of try and encourage clients to think about is, I mean, there's a big discussion around PEPs, you know, politically exposed yes. persons, yes. which is now a very popular term, you know. Well, like people just look you, you look you up in Google, right? And you're a PEP, right? Mm. But I think a, a much more useful way to think about this sort of thing is politically exposed assets. Yes. So I think right now, I and mean, if if you ask a miner who's operating in the DRC, you don't need to tell them that their asset is politically exposed. Yeah. But in Tanzania, in, in Tanzania is another great example. But I think. Increasingly, when, when you've got such political instability mm. and such volatility that affects any kind of investment that's mm. cross-border, it, it, it becomes relevant to think more about who your counterparties are. And they're not just counterparties like banks and insurance mm. companies. It's, you know, which country can I rely upon to protect me if something goes wrong? If I have an asset in Kenya and, mm. you know, if something happens with the government, you know, can I go to the US? Can I go to the EU? I mean, do those institutions carry the same mm. weight and value that they used to? I mean, it's the answers aren't clear and they're always on a case-by-case -case basis but I think that if you think about it through that prism yes that's the right approach to look at it right I mean and it's the only way you can come to a resolution yeah. I think but I'm sure even investors are thinking of it the same way right you know if I put my money there is it safe so that it might look great on the ticket I've got a 20 percent IRR but will I ever get it out again right let me go to two uh, other proximate issues. One is the Australian election result. I, I got a very good friend of mine who's Australian who was quite taken aback by this result. Were you? Indeed. Yes. Indeed. I mean, for context, I am Australian. Yes. Uh, and I think everyone had expected the Labor Party to mm. win by three to four seats. That's what everyone was predicting. In fact, yep. Sportsbet, who's the biggest bookmaker in Australia. And normally, they're pretty good. They paid up two days before the election. Wow for people who backed Labor. I mean, people were that certain. Wow. And then, you know... So what changed it at the last moment? I mean, I, I don't think there was necessarily one matter. Well, people weren't telling... I mean, I mean in fact, the, the death of uh, arguably the greatest post-war Prime Minister, Bob mm. Hawke, mm. which happened, I think, three days before the election. Yes. Um, 
should have got more votes than Labour. He was a Labour Prime Minister. Correct. And, that, and so people thought, well, that's absolutely certain mm. now. I mean, that was really the only prevailing dominant media event that happened just before the election. Um, I think it's, it's again, it, it, it's as a result of this volatility, perhaps it's because people want to race to that to that accepted, calm, neutral mm -hmm. position of, I mean, Scott Morrison, the, the, the now prime, or the was prime, the incumbent prime minister, ran a campaign that was bereft of policy. Mm. I mean, the, the, the campaign seemed to be, if there's a camera, run from it. Yes, uh, and, and it worked. It worked, and frankly, Bill Shorten's um, had, had sort of two or three years to put together a comprehensive package, which he also didn't mm. do. Um, an interesting result, um, and again, the results uh, aren't absolutely finalised, is that we might get a crossbench, yes. which, which um, encourages some movement on climate change, which I think would be a real positive out of the election. Because you've, you've been also at the cutting edge of climate change, right, in terms of the very hot summers you get and, and this very, very extreme weather, just like we're getting on. I mean, we, we were, we were growing, growing up in Melbourne. I mean, we, yeah. we had very, very dark summers where we lost hundreds of people to bushfires. Wow. I mean, we were at the, it was, you know, incredibly tragic. We mm. don't need to be told about climate mm. change. I mean, we had a hole in the ozone layer, which I believe is sort of partially closed now, if not entirely closed. But we were the first people to really mm. understand the, the, the effects, of course, with the Polynesian and Melanesian islands. But again, I think one thing that we should mention, mm. a positive result, was Tony Abbott losing his seat. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> in, I saw that. In, yeah. in Warringah, I think that was a, a <laughs> consolation prize for people, uh, frankly, on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> Let me ask you now, you spent a lot of time working in Turkey, right, with, with, with the government. How do you read that situation at the moment? You know, the markets have been punishing the Turkish lira. Um, he, uh, I, the, the, my impression is that he continues to thumb his nose at his, some of his allies in NATO, and he then gets this reaction, which is kind of financial warfare as well, whether deliberate or, or, or by yeah. accident, but it certainly feels like that. How would you characterize that situation? I think, I mean, there was a, a quote that you mentioned in your, in mm. your opening, which was, um, the future cannot be seen through the rear view mirror. Yes. And I think this is a case which fundamentally disproves that. I mean, if you examine Turkish politics mm. since Ataturk, so the early 20s, they really have been riding that geopolitical wave between, it's a riptide really, yes. between the US and, and the then USSR and now Russia. And running that gauntlet is a very, very difficult thing to do. Mm. Uh, and especially when you have you know, important air bases like Inchalik, which is a NATO air base, and then you're buying Ru Russian Russian S-400s. Exactly. Mm. So it stands to reason that economic warfare is a very, very easy thing very. To, to, to wage against someone. Very easy. Mm. And Trump likes doing that, mm. I've noticed, whether it's him or somebody else in the background. It but seems to be, a, it's, it's, it's almost just a gangster negotiation tactic. I'm going to, you know... But, but, I mean, the most extreme example has got to be Iran, where you've completely, practically choked off any oil sales. I mean, very coercive, sanctioned mm. warfare. You've put them in a situation which is really unprecedented. But I, I think Erdogan also experienced the same thing and di didn't seem to me to be... Uh, Sun Tzu enough to kind of sidestep it, he'd come, he'd come arguing back. I mean, the, the, there are some very, very good examples mm. um, of, of where Erdogan has played it well. Yes. But it seems that the forces against him have managed to succeed or perhaps been better funded, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, but if you, if you remember the Erdogan after the Arab Spring, mm. um, if you remember the Erdogan in the early days of you know, the, the, the Syrian war, yes. uh, really being instrumental in bringing a lot of the parties to the table, including Iran, um, the Iranian, the Iranian dispute, of mm. course, is a bit different because it plays it plays directly into the influence of MBS and MBZ. Yes, uh, in the region, uh, and Netanyahu, and Netanyahu, of mm. course. Um, and you see, you see now, you know, com com combating against Iran, the, the sort of the GCC blockade is popping. It's yeah. it's popping up again, and, and Qatar can't fall in line for two reasons. I think one. Um, it probably shouldn't, yes, because it was, uh, I think, frankly, unfairly treated. It was terribly um, in, treated. Insofar as one can be mm. in, in geopolitics, but also people forget that the largest gas field in the world is co-owned by Qatar and Iran. Yes, um, and this is the field that's on the border. It's yeah, in the, in mm. the Strait of Hormuz. Mm. It um, is it being exploited? Not yet. But they've it's in the Strait of Hormuz. Yeah, and so they've. Yeah. So no one's going to explore <laughs> that. <laughs> right. Where I would like to have, where I would like to have a gas field. No, it's it, but it is it is 
uh, uh, from exploration, the largest field in the world, mm. and they've signed deals to exploit, know, exploit it. it. Yes. And so Qatar naturally thinks, well, you know, yeah. war, war against Iran. I mean, war against Iran is no good for anybody. Know, dozens of reasons. Yes, yes. Oh, anybody. No, because if, I mean, they're for a completely different challenge. I would have thought than mm. Iraq or Gaddafi. You know, the, the, this is a country which has been, uh, you know, developed for quite a while. And I, you think that the the U.S. would remember the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah. I mean, multiple times. You think that Saudi Arabia would remember the immediate lesson of Yemen? Yes. And of course, Syria. Yeah which has been decimated by all of those parties involved. That's right. In, or, and in addition to the domestic mm. government. So it's, it, it seems to me that this position of escalation is not well thought through mm. and uh, is, is, is about personality politics and dominating a region that doesn't necessarily have to be dominated by one person. No, and it one probably country. can't be dominated mm. anymore by one person, right? Mm. Given that we're in the 21st century. Absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to this idea of yours, which is this volatility uh, 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 thing, where you were saying that you know we're living in a much more volatile environment, and that is, you know you also before we were walking in was were giving me the example of Brexit, mm. where the can has been kicked down the road till <laughs> sometime in October, uh, and it seems to have all gone quiet, but that thing is still coming looming at them, right? I mean, I mean, it it tells you that. Um, a period of stability is created yeah. by delaying a period of instability. It's, I mean, that that is so. That, so that is the Taleb perspective that no, no, you know, a fragile s system is actually more fragile if you just try. You, you watch those David Attenborough series, and it's yes. the, sort of the polar bear on the tiny piece of ice sort of floating yes, out of the yes. ocean. I mean, that's really what that is. It's just extraordinary, mm. just extraordinary. And then in terms of you know the types of how are your clients uh, looking to deal with this new reality then? I think that and what are you telling them? I mean, what I'm telling them is 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 simple. It's 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 case by case, mm. and you have to look at the political imperatives of your asset, potential investment, or you know the attack that you're mm. that's being brought against you personally. And it might be that the minister of finance hates you mm. because you know his wife was from a different tribe that you otherwise didn't expect. It could be that. Mm. It could be the the Qatar Saudi Arabia issue, where mm. really it's about a gas field that they don't want the other to exploit because they'll become too rich. Um, it could be... Is that what it is in your mind? I think that's a large part of it. Yeah. I think that's a large part of it. And of course there are... Other issues. Uh, but many other yeah, issues. That, the whole Shia Sunni thing and yeah, all of that. Mm. Exactly. Um, sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought there, but the, I mean, the volatility for clients just manifests in very specific and un unexpected ways. Mm. And what you have to do is... That, I mean, the, the sort of 15 years ago you talked to companies about corporate responsibility and sustainability and they thought, well, that's an unnecessary cost that I don't need to spend money on. Yes. And now you can't, ha you can't make any decision without factoring those two things. Yeah. And I think that, uh, to go back to this, the DRC mining example before, of course those guys know that their asset is politically exposed and they have to think about mm. you know, relations with the government and, and how that impacts you know, FCPA requirements but back in the US and the UK well, bribery in, Act. In the DR Congo's case, uh, the head of Glencore wasn't even allowed to meet with the President Kabila. He had to go through an interlocutor, so that right. of itself. Right. Uh, you know, told you of the type of risk they were wearing. But I mean, I, I even I wrote an I wrote an article about six months back talking mm. about, you know, a, a, an example that you wouldn't otherwise think was politically exposed. It's it was the construction of a bridge in Sydney. Yes. And when you make a bridge in Sydney, let me tell you, mm. you're going to you're going to annoy a lot of people, or you're going to make a lot of people happy. Yes. And how, a state government election was one off the back of the the, the 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 construction of that bridge. And the whole election, the whole campaign mm. was, was the head contractor performing under the contract? Was the subcontractor performing under their subcontract? Mm. And so, you know, the investment from, from the banks and the funds and of course the construction firm itself was, was front and centre of a mm. political campaign, which I'm sure they did not, I mean, of course, it's a mm. bridge, but you, you, didn't, you don't anticipate that quite in the same way as you would if you're pulling lithium out of the mine in Katanga. Mm. Wow. We've got about three or four minutes to go. Tell us a little bit about what your practice is doing in Africa besides Bobby Wine. What else are you looking at and where, it, where are, you are you finding it a good opportunity uh, in, in terms of what we're seeing? I mean, ab absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, as, as frontier markets and emerging markets, of course, experience these issues as, mm. as especially government bureaucracies go through that difficult period of moving from, you know, the colonial period through to, through to where we are today with some bumps along the way. Mm. Uh, they tend to be more difficult bureaucracies and governments to deal with than 
I mean, unless you deal with the French government, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so helping people navigate that, mm. that um, process is very important and mm. it's very important for the clients. Um, and of course, it, wrapped up in that is not just the, the sort of international legal commercial aspects because quite often now governments will bring sort of trumped up mm. criminal complaints against the in-country directors of that client. So you've got to be able to understand that. Mm. Quite often they can be incarcerated and you know, the human rights... Well, we don't have to look too far to know wh where that's been happening. Well, absolutely. And really, I mean, if you look at something, uh, you know, like what you're describing, a state can, can put enormous pressure on a company in, and make it practically, uh, you know, remove the license to operate because it becomes impossible. Your staff are being locked up on trumped up things. You're not allowed to bring, you know, qualified personnel in. Is the state, does, do they hold all the aces then in that relationship? It depends on the country and it depends mm. on the company. Mm. But I also think that a, a third point must be made, which is a government isn't a government. Mm. A government is a series of different power bases. From a president, there's mm. a prime minister, there's a parliament, if mm. there's a military, if there's a treasury. And quite often those parties don't mm. necessarily align or get on, with it, get on with each other at all. So it's about finding a way to understand that firstly and then navigate the best way forward. Mm. So it's about redressing the imbalance, as you said, but it's about doing it in a sensible way. I mean, there is, there is a way to do it mm. that isn't adversarial and that is, works well for everyone because you know, mining companies aren't the big bad wolves of the, of the West. No. You know, they want to come and invest and, and provide jobs and invest in the local communities. And yeah. there is a way to do that. No, excellent. Simon, thank you for making the time today. Thank it's you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Simon Wolf. I can say to you, pleasure. Marlowe's strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was The Smart Investor, this was Metropole TV. My name was Ali Khan Satchi, and with me today was Simon Wolf, who's much more than a lawyer and, and is the managing director of Marlowe's Strategy and is doing a lot of interesting work, as you can probably gather. Thank you for watching.